coming out and being a part of our service. We enjoy and love having visitors in our midst and around, around and with us. And uh, we just love uh, loving on people. And we hope that you've been made to feel that way. And we just uh, welcome you here this morning. Uh, just a couple of real quick uh, announcements. The first is Jordan Pomeroy has in, in, uh, asked me to uh, remind you of the military box that we have in the back. We will be sending out another shipment very, very soon to our uh, uh, servicemen and women that are in uh, across the world. And so uh, if you would be looking for uh, the list of different items that are, they'll be uh, uh, on our emails, you'll see them uh, uh, up on the board and you'll see them in different places. But if you need to ask her, so Jordan, wave at me forward, you please back there on the back row, just see her and she can give you an idea of what kind of uh, things we're looking for in our military boxes. And then I don't know about you, but I've already started to get excited about next Sunday night. Uh, we're just going to have a great time celebrating together 11 years. Uh, the first celebration that we've ever had of any sort of uh, 11 years at Pecan uh, has been in existence. We've got some of the people that have coming back from that were here in the very, very beginning. And uh, we've invited uh, lots and lots of people. So uh, just uh, come back and make sh plans to be here next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. And then we're just going to have a good time today and next Sunday morning. And we'll have a good time then, too. How's that? We'll just do it all. Let's have a good time every time we get together, right? Let's stand together. Let's sing a beautiful song called Hat Calvary. At Calvary. Sing it out together. Thank you, thank you again for being here with us today. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not for me. Calvary, mercy there was great, grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burden so found liberty. Many of you like this too on these, this front row where they've come in their pajamas. I think we ought to just have a pajama Sunday every Sunday, right? For all of everybody else that wants to do that. Turn around and shake somebody's hand. Give them a good fist bump this morning before we sing our next song. seated when you get done let's sing out another song together rescue the perishing <laughs> it's not a good stopping place <laughs> Terry make him stop okay <laughs> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, stem in pity from sin and the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the 
fallen. The Lamb of Jesus, the mighty to save, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him still, is waiting, waiting the pit, the child to receive. Plead with him earnestly, with him gently. We'll forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing or the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a saint has died. Rescue the perishing or the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save opportunity to rescue the perishing came at Calvary, did it not? We're so glad for what Jesus Christ did on that cross and the opportunity we have to share that good news with all of those around us. Another old, old song, but we just love it. I think it's one of your, you guys' favorite songs, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. Come Thou Found of Every Blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mount of thy Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. I want to praise him. I want to praise him all day long. I want to worship him. I want to be the one that is there standing in the front row with my arms lifted high and letting the word of God speak to us. And that's where we need to be this morning. Word of God, speak to us. Allow us to worship you today. Finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, it's okay. Last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say, word of God speak. Let me stay and rest in your holiness, Word of God. 
Father, we love you. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for the noise. Thank you for the quiet that comes in our lives when we allow you to speak to us, when we allow you to have the preeminence in our hearts and in our lives. And just as we just allow you to speak to us and we worship you this morning, we just thank you for this opportunity and we thank you for Steve and the message that you have given him all week as he has prepared it, that you would just uh, use it in our lives. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Great to see you guys today. And I'm going to, I guess we're going to take a little reprieve from Nehemiah. And nobody amen that. That's good. So we'll be on back in Nehemiah next week, but we're going to be doing the Lord's Supper today, if you can see. And I haven't covered some of these scriptures in a long time, and they're very important scriptures. If you want to go ahead and turn there, it's this 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you want to find it. And Paul has given instructions to the church at Corinth. Now, I want to tell you ahead of time what this morning, what we're going to do. This morning, we're going to be passing the plate, and there will be ushers that are passing the plates down the aisle. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you can partake of the Lord's Supper. That's the only requirement besides for examining yourselves, which we're going to look at that also. But now, as they pass out the bread first, hold on to it, and then we'll all do it together and just follow my cues, okay? And then the same thing with the cup. Once they get it all passed out, then I'll give you the cue, and then we'll partake of the cup. So just kind of follow my lead on that, and I hope I don't get mixed up. But if I do, then all glory to the Lord anyway, correct? So God is good. So now we're going to look at the church at Corinth because, to be frank, they were making a mess of the Lord's Supper. I want to start in verse 20, and we're going to look at a couple verses here as far as what they were doing. Therefore, Paul says, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's telling them, you're not doing the Lord's Supper. You're doing something else. Look at verse 21. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. And Paul says, what? <laughs> So they are making an absolute mess of it. What's, what's happening is they're bringing, it's like a potluck, and they're bringing their own food, but then they're not sharing with those who are in need. And then some others, apparently it's BYOB also, bring your own bottle, because they're bringing in a wine, and they're all getting, some of them are getting drunk at this ceremony. So they're making an absolute mess of this. Now, I will tell you this. A celebration is great. You know why? Because we live in a time, the church age is a time of great celebration, we're not in mourning because the tomb is empty. We're in a time of rejoicing. Rejoice, rejoice. I say it again, rejoice, Paul says. We're in a time of great celebration. And it will be that way until the church is raptured out, which that is even mentioned in this scripture also. Now, I want to tell you, look, look at our youth up at the front. This isn't all that were here. There were 19. Some of them are going to be asleep in short order because they had a lock-in, a pajama lock-in. And so Sam doesn't look good. He looks pretty bad. Where, where's Josh and Brandis? Are they here? Oh, I didn't even recognize you. 
in their pajamas. Yeah, yeah, Brandis, you look, I think you look the best of all, really. I don't know why that is. Yeah. Josh looks terrible. And I, and I asked Josh, I said, how does Brandis look? He said, she just looks mad. <laughs> but anyway, here's the thing. They had 19 at the lock-in last night, and they had a salvation last night. Now, is, is the, the kid, salvation, is still here? Right, I'm not going to embarrass him or anything or make him stand up or anything like that. But I'll tell you, today then, since because of his salvation, he can partake of the Lord's Supper today. I mean, think of that. And this is a visual picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's a visual. Some of you like pictures better than you do words or better than you do listening. This is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only requirement here for you to participate is to be a believer in Jesus Christ and to examine yourselves which we're going to look at. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So they were making an absolute mess of it. And look what Paul says. What? Some of you are getting drunk. Some of you are eating and not sharing your food with other people. Look at what Paul says. Do you not have houses in which to eat or drink? Do that stuff at home, not here at this ceremony. Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. And in verse 23, Paul begins, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So he's telling them, these instructions I received directly from the Lord. And saying, Paul's not being selfish either. Paul is passing them on. And that's our responsibility too. And I love that about Paul. Paul gave his life after his conversion, conversion on the Damascus Road. He was sharing everything he knew. And about two-thirds of the New Testament are things that he wrote, letters he wrote to churches sharing what he knew. You know, and that is our responsibility also, just to share what we know, to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that we live, the way that we speak, in all areas of our life. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So there's bread, and then there's wine or the cup, right? And we use grape juice here, but it's, it's the same thing. And you know what? In going into John, I'm not going to turn there, but Jesus said at one point, said, You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he was talking about it symbolically and figuratively. He was talking about this. And if you do, you abide in me, he said. And people misunderstood him. And people have misunderstood that for centuries, thinking he's talking about cannibalism, and he certainly is not. And the Catholic Church believes in something called transubstantiation. That's where they believe because of that statement that Jesus made, which was sim symbolism, because of that statement he made, then therefore when the priest prays over these elements, they actually become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what they believe. We don't. We understand that to be symbolism. We believe this is symbolic. This is a symbolic picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now the, the body, the broken body of Christ and the blood, that goes back. That is not, not a new thing. This is not a new thing at all. I want to turn now to Hebrews chapter 10 because, see, the Old Testament sacrifices that have been going on for centuries all point to this very thing. That was the reason for it. Have you ever wondered why the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, why that was implemented? Why did God do that? Even to the garden, the first animal that was slain was to make clothing for Adam and Eve. The first bloodshed was after the first sin, immediately after. Without the shedding of blood, is it impossible to please God? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So now here in Hebrews chapter 10, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Now imagine yourself as being a priest in the temple. Would you get tired of the bloodshed? I'll bet that you would. Every single day, the slaying of animals and the shedding of blood. Don't you think that would get really old? Man, I do. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. 
For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So what was their purpose? Their purpose was to a foreshadowing of what was coming, a foreshadowing of that God was going to come in the flesh and sacrifice himself, and by his shed blood, we would have forgiveness of sins. It's a foreshadowing, a picture of it going forward. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. Now, that's taken from several scriptures, but primarily Psalm chapter 40. With Psalm chapter 40, we're not going to go there today, but I encourage you to read it. It is the words and the prayers of the Messiah all the way through the cross. Have you ever noticed that before? It is an amazing scripture, and this scripture is taken from, mostly taken from Psalm chapter 40. Now, in verse 8, it says, After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, imagine, there probably was a priest, an Old Testament priest, that came to Jesus Christ and accepted him as a Lord and Savior. Many people in Jerusalem did. Most of the time, we read about the ones who are in conflict with Jesus Christ, but I'm sure there were some that did. Now, imagine if you're one of those priests and you've lived your whole life sacrificing animals, shedding blood over and over and over for the forgiveness of sins. But see that? The reason that it worked for forgiveness of sins is by people would take that sacrifice as a matter of faith. It wasn't the the shedding of blood of the animals, people would take it for their forgiveness of sins as a matter of faith. But now imagine if you're one of those people in the temple that's constantly, day after day after day, shedding blood, and then you accept Jesus Christ and you understand that he is the one sacrifice to end all sacrifices, to eventually end all bloodshed, to eventually end all sin who brought about this whole mess in the first place. Imagine if you had that experience Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first order and to establish the second. Look at verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. And that is currently the time that we're in. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Man, I want to show you one more scripture turning back in Hebrews chapter 2. Not one, I just, I just lied to you, I didn't mean to. We got a, a couple more scriptures left. Verse 14 through 18 of Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's talking about us, we have flesh and blood. And we are the children of God, and we have flesh and blood. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power over death, that is, the devil. That's amazing. You see, in the garden by man, sin entered into the world. And then God, bringing it full circle by man, is going to redeem it. The God-man, Jesus Christ. So it was fell by flesh and blood, and it's going to be redeemed by flesh and blood. Do you see the beautiful picture in the way that God did it? By one man, the first Adam, it fell. By the last Adam, Jesus Christ, it's all redeemed. And we haven't experienced all the redemption yet. You've experienced spiritual redemption in your soul, but the redemption of all the creation, your physical redemption also, your physical resurrection to eternity, more immortality is yet to take place. But all of that is a result of the power of the cross displayed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To, I forgot where I was. Oh yes, flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. You see, we don't have to fear death anymore. We're not in that type of slavery anymore. The Bible says a person that believes, 
Their day of their death is better than the day of their birth. And that's the truth. Now, sure, we might fear change a little bit, fear of the unknown, but I promise you, it is going to be awesome. And it is far better than anything we've experienced here. We don't have to live under that shadow or that fear of death. For as assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So we can never say, look, you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like living in this fallen world. You don't know what it's like to be me. We can't say those things. Jesus Christ was tempted far beyond anybody that was tempted in this room, far beyond any temptation that anybody on earth has ever experienced. Jesus was tempted greater and harder. So we don't have a claim. We can't make a claim that we, he doesn't know what it's like. Now turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 again. In verse 26, continuing with the text, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now we're supposed to do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. He commanded that twice, once with the body and once with the blood. Do this in remembrance. We're supposed to remember what he did for us because, see, we're looking backwards at the cross. The people with the Old Testament sacrificial system, by faith, they were looking forward to the cross. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, correct? So we're looking backwards. Do this in remembrance. We're to remember what God has done for us. And sometimes, day by day by day, we can have a tendency to forget. We can have a tendency to forget the incredible thing that God did through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection. Don't forget it. Today we remember. So we are supposed to remember, but there's something else in this verse too. See, for often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So by partaking of the Lord's Supper, you're declaring, you're making a public confession that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what you're saying. You're making a public confession. This is a visualization of you accepting Jesus Christ of your Lord and Savior and you having forgiveness of sins. That's what's going on here, and that's what this is about. Do it in remembrance. But I tell you, there's something else in verse 26 which I really like. We're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes because he's not dead anymore, and he is coming back. And the church is going to proclaim his death until he comes back. So how long is this going to take place? This take place of the Lord's Supper. It's going to continue to happen until the Lord comes back for his bride, his church. Then it will stop, but not until then. You know, many countries on the face of this earth are trying to wipe out Christianity from even existing. Well, right here, in Jesus' words, that will not happen. It's not going to happen. Because, see, the church will proclaim the Lord's death by doing this until he comes back, until the rapture of the church. So right there, Jesus said, the church will always exist until the rapture. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. In some country, they're facing martyrdom and great difficulties. But the church will always exist. Now, starting in verse 27, I'm going to get to a, something that will, uh, is a little bit, well, it's all serious, but it's very serious. And oftentimes in the modern church, I think these things are, type of things are skipped over. And so you don't hear of sin being talked about very much anymore in a lot of churches. And it's going to talk about discipline and the Lord's discipline, and we're going to turn to that scripture too. But I'll tell you, this is very important, and it is a warning it's a serious warning for us. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So now look, you cannot lose your salvation. Okay, the scripture is clear about that. You can't lose your salvation, but there are consequences for sin here. If we make a mockery of the death of Jesus Christ, or we continue in sin without repentance, then we open ourselves up for consequences. You see, there are no consequences for us with sin in eternal life. Okay, but a loving father will discipline his children here. Now, to the unbeliever, 
They're not God's children. The unbeliever doesn't get disciplined here. They get disciplined in the afterlife for the rejection of Jesus Christ. So what is this talking about? There's two, there's two types of people in this room then. I'm going to assume, first of all, that everybody's a believer in Jesus. That's my first assumption. At that point then, according to the scripture, there's two types of people today for this remembrance, this celebration. There's two types of people. There are those who are going to take this in an unworthy manner and those who are not going to. They're going to, look at verse 28, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink the cup. So what do we do? If we have unconfessed sin, or we're struggling, well then, lift it up to God. Pray. Forgiveness of sins is available for us. For forgiveness, you have forgiveness of sins for eternal life, but forgiveness from the consequence of sins here. You have that forgiveness available today, and that's what this is talking about. So we must examine ourselves now here's the good thing it doesn't say you must examine your neighbor that's a good thing right we have to examine ourselves this is a personal thing between you and God so you must examine yourself and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly for this reason many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep that sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? In the New Testament, when it says sleep, that means death. So now, I want to tell you outright, we never had the opportunity because of the consequences of sin to decide, well, you know what? That person probably had sin in their life. That's why they're sick. This person probably had sin in their life. So that's why they died young. We don't, have that, we don't have that opportunity. Bad things happen. Remember the Tower of Siloam? Jesus said, do you suppose any of those that died by that tower falling? We're worse sinners than anybody else. See, it's not like that. What we have is a loving father who disciplines us in some way, and he doesn't, God has used my back to discipline me and correct me a couple of times in my life, but that doesn't mean he's, if you have a bad back, then you're being disciplined. It's personal. And when God disciplines you, however he does it, you will know what it is. And nobody can tell you that it's not that because it's between you and the Lord. And every single person is different. And God deals with every single person different. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. He didn't even take care of everything. So now turn to Hebrews chapter 12. You know, I have heard a preacher say to someone when they said, I believe I'm being disciplined of the Lord. That's why I'm having this problem. I've heard a preacher say, God doesn't do that. Oh, really? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 4. Now, he's talking about resisting sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Look at this. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It's for the purpose of growing you in the likeness of Jesus Christ. If you get off course, God is going to try to get you on course. Now, he's not going to make you, but he will discipline you. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? You know, I'm thinking about disciplining my kids. I never enjoyed that. I never enjoyed it at all. In fact, I really kind of hated it. But it was important. It was very important. And I could tell you sometimes I disciplined my kids out of anger. And sometimes I did it right and I disciplined my kids out of love. But what if I had never disciplined them at all? then the Bible says I don't even love them. See, God's the same way with us. And if you grew up without a father in your home, then you may have a skewed idea of what discipline of the Lord, loving discipline looks like. Or if you grew up with an abusive father, you may have a skewed idea of what loving discipline looks like. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers when you are 
Ill illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to this father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who are being trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So it's important. And it's real. Don't be surprised by it. You know, we need to become, I wonder if there's believers in here, and I believe there are believers in here who are oblivious to that they've been disciplined from time to time by the Lord. You know, we know that bad things happen in this world. And, and to those of us, like we never get to decide whether this person's being disciplined by the Lord or this person isn't. We don't get that. We don't, the only thing we can determine is if it's God is disciplining us individually. So today, in the scriptures, there's a calling for the examination of ourselves. So what does that look like? You just talk it to the Lord. Asking him to reveal any sins you may have. Repenting of any sins and asking for forgiveness. That's what we do. So during this time, I want to have a, a moment of just silence. And no, piano players don't have to come up yet for this. But just a moment of silence and give everybody an opportunity to examine themselves. And then I'll close it in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, first of all, we come to you today and we are, I myself and us collectively, we are asking for forgiveness of any sins that we have, things we have done, things we've left undone, whatever the case may be, God, we just lay those down at the foot of the cross. Thank you so much. God, we also thank you specifically that you are a loving Father who cares enough to discipline us from time to time. And God, we ask that you make it obvious, and I think sometimes it's happened and you've corrected us and we were even unaware of what was going on. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And we look back to the Old Testament where they sacrificed animals by blood over and over and over, all pointing to Jesus Christ. And then we get to look back at the cross and the resurrection and understand what we're doing here today and about, about why there was so much shedding of blood in the Old Testament and now the celebration and the rejoicing as a result of the empty tomb. God, we also just want to thank you and praise you today. God, we're doing this service in remembrance for what you have done, but we want to be super thankful. And we praise your name for coming up with such an idea that no man would even conceive of, that by the only begotten Son, that redemption would take place to fix the huge sin problem on this earth. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Will the men come forward?